get to it. <clears throat> As we ended last week, you remember that Peter and John had been before the court. They had been taken in twice to the court. They were put in jail. And the high priest, Annas and Caiaphas, who were the same ones who sent Jesus to trial, um, were put in jail. They wanted, the high priest wanted to kill them, but they knew they couldn't do that because the people were too enthralled with them and what they were doing and the miracles they were performing. And this all started, remember, with the healing of a crippled man, a man who had been crippled since birth, and he was healed. And, and hard to imagine, they got angry about that. Anyway, so remember as we ended, Gamaliel said, hey, let this go. If this is just of man, it'll die away. But if it's not, if it's of God, you'll only find yourself fighting against God. That sounded reasonable to them. So they let them go after they beat them. <clears throat> and then it tell, this, the text tells us that they went on their way rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer for the name. Today we're going to be looking at Stephen, who was the first martyr, and I don't want to forget this. I was going to do it during my lesson, but I'm afraid since it's not in my notes, I might forget it. But there is a conference put on by the Voice of the Martyrs, which is going to be right here in Tucson at Christ Community Church on February 29th. It's 9 to 4, and it looks like it's a free day that you can register online or at the door. You can just show up. I think that this will be a great day to find what's going on with those who are being martyred for their faith. Christ Community Church is, I think, downtown-ish. It's somewhere kind of far away from here, I know. And, um, but I think if people carpooled and went together, that this would be a great conference to go to. It's February 29th, 9 to 4, Christ Community Church, Voice of the Martyrs, okay? If you have any questions, I'll leave this up here, and you can see it. Okay, Judy showed that to us today, and thank you, Judy, for sharing that with us. Okay, so as we begin today, we are going to look at one of the seven who was appointed to take care of the widows in the church. Remember, the Grecian widows got upset with the Hebraic widows because they thought they were getting better food or more food or something like that. It doesn't tell us exactly what their problem was, but we know they were complaining. And so the apostles said, we need to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. So let's choose seven men who are full of faith in the Holy Spirit and let, let them take over this responsibility. And so they chose seven men. The first two listed were Stephen and Philip. And those are the two that we are going to talk about today. The scripture tells us there in, in chapter 6 that Stephen was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom. He was full of faith. He was full of grace and power. What a man. And so God had a special job for him. And we'll find out that he ended up being the first martyr of the Christian church. So they, um, there were some people who um, opposed Stephen. They were members of a synagogue of the freedmen. Now, probably these were former slaves who had come to Jerusalem. They were freed, and they all seemed to congregate in one synagogue. Now, let me just explain to you, because some of you may not clearly understand the difference between the synagogue and the temple. You remember there was only one temple. It was in Jerusalem, and that's where the sacrifices took place every day. That's where they all came to celebrate the feast at the beautiful Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. 
However, because the Jews had been spread out through the dispersion, they couldn't all make it to the temple every Sabbath. And so synagogues rose up probably after they came back from the captivity, the exile in Babylon. And that's probably when they started um, having different places where they could go to worship on Sabbath. And those would be more like our local churches they, so that you could get to one reasonably. And if you know any, uh, if you live near any area that has um, Orthodox Jewish people, you know that they're syn they all live right around their synagogues so that they can walk to church every Sabbath because they don't want to do the work of going in their cars. So anyway, they were at this synagogue, and um, so they, uh, they had questions and opposition for Stephen. But when Stephen replied to them, the text tells us they could not stand up against the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. God, he was a man full of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided and directed him, and they just didn't have answers for him because his answers were from the Lord. And so they did what they became a habit with them. They stirred up the people against them, and they took Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. This is now the third court appearance already of um, the apostles. And then Stephen, they brought him, before there, and because they couldn't find anything he did wrong, they had to bring in false witnesses. And these false witnesses said, this fellow never stopped speaking against the holy place, the temple, and against the law. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Okay, so let's look at what they're accusing him of. Things that are actually true, but they're giving him wrong motives in this. They said that he speaks against the temple, against the law, and also that he was going to change the customs of the Jewish people, no doubt those that were related to the law. And so then Stephen stood up to respond to them, but he didn't give a typical defense of himself like we would expect in a court. Instead, if you read this, you saw that he gave a history of the nation of Israel, a great history, very informative, went all the way from um, Abraham all the way to the end. And if you just read it cursorily, you think it's just a history. But if you read it carefully, really carefully, you see that Stephen was trying to make some points in this. He was trying to show them, when they said that he spoke against the temple, against the law, against the customs, he was trying to show them, look, God's way has changed through the years. It hasn't been stagnant. He hasn't done the same thing forever. But as we have progressed, he progressed in giving more and more enlightenment about his plan. For example, you remember, those of you who were in our Genesis course, we talked about when God created the world, He oh, first of course with Adam and Eve, they sinned, and then he dealt with the world at large, the whole world. And what happened then? Tower of Babel, they turned against him, and so then God chose one family, the family of Abraham, who lived in Mesopotamia, not the promised land of Israel. He was from Mesopotamia. And God called him out and asked him to come to the land that God would show him. And there God made his promises to Abraham. So Abraham, you see, God has already made a change in the way he deals with man. He first dealt with the whole world. And now he has narrowed it so that he is dealing with Abraham. And he made promises to Abraham that Abraham, he made a covenant, a promise that would last forever, an everlasting promise that through Abraham, all the nations of the world would be blessed. And of course, we know that that is because that's where the Redeemer would come.
So he narrowed it so now everyone in the world, even if they're not Jewish, they know if they want to find the Redeemer, it has been narrowed to Abraham because that's what how God did it. And then after Abraham, you remember he had his son Isaac and then Joseph, I mean then Jacob. Jacob had two sons. I mean, Isaac had two sons. Jacob had 12 sons. And you remember that out of those 12 sons, Joseph was the one who obeyed his father the best. He was probably the favorite son. And what happened? There were 10 who rebelled against Joseph. They took him out of where they were. They sent him into Egypt. He lived in Egypt. See, you see, during this time, it has nothing to do with the land. He's showing the change that God made here in sending his people through Joseph to Egypt. And, he, and they stayed in Egypt there for 400 years. During that time, after, of course, Joseph had been rejected by his brothers. Then he was the one who delivered his brothers and gave them food. And then after 400 years of bondage in Egypt, you remember that God sent a deliverer, Moses. He raised him up to bring the people out. But first of all, you remember that Moses saw some of the Israelites in a fight with some of the Egyptians, and he stepped in to, to break up the fight, and he killed the Egyptian. And then the next day, when he did went to his brothers to help. His brother said, what are you going to do? Kill us like you killed the Egyptian? You see, Moses thought that they would understand that he wanted to help deliver them, but they didn't. They rejected Moses' leadership. And so then Moses went out of the land for 40 years. He went to Midian. He got married. He had children in Midian. And 40 years later, God brought him back back to the land, and then you remember that he was the one who delivered them out of Egypt. And when he did, we talked about it Sunday, those of you who were at CS CCSB, he brought them to um, Sinai. They not only rejected Moses at Sinai, but they rejected God at Sinai. You remember they built the idol and they fell down and worshipped him. You see the pattern? They have, a, they have a habit of rejecting the leadership that God sends to them. And then later they reject, remember they rejected God again. That was the one that we talked about on Sunday when they came almost to the land. They were on the cusp of entering the land. And God said, I'm going to give this land to you. It's a wonderful land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It doesn't get any better. And they came back and said, no, 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 we can't do that. The people in that land are large and we cannot obey God and do what he says to do. They rejected God. God again. This has become a way of life for them. And so then as he goes through this history, he is showing them that, that you, rejected, you rejected Moses, you rejected God, and Eve, Moses, remember, had promised them, God will send you a prophet like me, Jesus. Listen to him and do what he said. But again, the fathers refused to obey. And he, go, he shows them that they worship the temple, but the temple itself is a building that first was a tabernacle that was temporary. And then he says, the temple, while it's wonderful and beautiful and that's where the presence of God is, that's not where God really lives. Heaven is where God is. That's his home. And he says, you stiff-necked people. You have been doing this since the inception of your nation. You have been rebelling against God. And you also rejected the prophet like Moses that he sent. Jesus, you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect, but have not obeyed it. 
So he's giving all of this history to show, look, you rejected Jesus, but that was because that was your pattern. You've rejected, has there ever been a prophet of God that you didn't reject? You've been doing this a long time. And so it culminated in the fact that you rejected Messiah God, the one that was sent to save you, you murdered. You can imagine how this went over. They were furious. It says they gnashed their teeth at them. And then Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, usually when we read about Jesus in heaven, we read about him sitting at the right hand of God. Here, Stephen sees him standing. Was he standing because he was getting ready to welcome Stephen into his presence? We don't know for sure, but that's a possibility. They were so angry, they covered up their ears, they were yelling, they were doing all of those things. And the witnesses who were watching all of this going on, because they were getting ready to get active, they put all of their clothes at the, coat, at the feet of a man, young man who was standing there named Saul, who was overlooking what was going on. And then they took Stephen and they took him to stone him. And evidently what they did is they would take him up on a scaffold. They would make sure he was, had no clothes on, that he was naked. And then there was a witness who would push him off the scaffold. He would fall to the ground. And then a second one would take a large stone and drop it either on his head or on his chest. And then the crowd would start throwing stones at him to kill him. If you can believe it, Stephen, this man full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, full of power, instead of getting angry in return as he, as the stones were hitting his body, we can only imagine how painful it was. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then in his dying breath, he said, do not hold this sin against them. When he said that, he died. Who does that remind you of? Jesus. What did Jesus say on the cross? Into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Evidently, Stephen had been there at the crucifixion. He had seen Jesus, and he emulated him, and in his faith, he was able to do what Jesus had done. Remarkable. Absolutely remarkable. A man full of faith, so full of faith, that he could accept this as from the hand of a good and loving God. And Saul stood there giving approval to all that went on. Well, on that day, there was a great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem because of what had happened to Stephen. And so all of those uh, who were believers, except for the apostles, were scattered out of Jerusalem. And they went into areas like um, Judea and Samaria. And there they began preaching in their new locations. Now, what does this tell you? You remember in... in um, Acts 1.8, just before Jesus went back into heaven, he said, you will be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem, that's where they've been witnessing, then in, first in Jerusalem and Judea, that was the southern kingdom, all of the southern part of the nation, and then in Samaria, which was, as we studied last year, the northern kingdom, and then to the uttermost parts of the world. So they have been in Jerusalem. They are now spreading out to Judea and up to Samaria. What are they doing? God is saying, remember God said, all things work together for good to them who love God. So God used these disastrous circumstances in the martyr of this faithful man, Stephen, to spread out the Christians so that now they're not all together. They've been strengthened as they've been together. 
and now he sends them out so that they can fulfill the next step of his commission to take the good news beyond Jerusalem. So that's exactly what they did. Now, uh, when they, of course, Simon, I mean, Stephen couldn't go because he was now dead, and so God used the second man who's listed out of those seven, Philip. And Philip went to Samaria. Now, what do you know about Samaria? You've all heard about Samaria because you've heard of the Good Samaritan, and we've always talked about the fact that uh, uh, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans, as you know, like from from John chapter 4 when Jesus was at the well. The reason is the Samaritans were considered half-breeds. When um, the, the kingdom separated into the north and the south, and the north was first taken into captivity, when they came back, they, came, they sent them back, not just the Jewish people, but they sent the Assyrians, sent some of their own, and other subjugated peoples back with the Jews so that they could dilute the Jewish race. So they sent back a lot of people who were not Jews and sent them back to the northern part of Israel. So then, of course, they intermarried and that race of people became known as the Samaritans. And the Jews, who were mostly in the southern part of Israel, looked down on the Samaritans because they were half-breeds. And this became such a division. It was actually the racism of that day. It became such a division that Jews and and uh, Samaritans had nothing to do with each other. Samaria became the capital of the northern kingdom, and they even built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. And then the Jews had their temple on Mount Zion, Solomon's temple. So the Jews, they separated at this point until the death of Stephen. They're dispersed because of the persecution, and so God sends Philip to Samaria. And when Philip got to Samaria, he met a man named Simon. <clears throat> now Simon was a sorcerer. That means he dealt in the occult, in demonism. And everybody followed him around because of the things that he could do by demonic power. And they even gave him the name, a messianic title, the Great Power, which was probably a way of saying that he was the one sent from God when actually he was the one sent from Satan. But then when Philip came and people believed in Jesus Christ, Philip could heal them. There were people that were healed. and There were miracles. Everybody was amazed at what went on. And then um, Peter and John came to Samaria. And when they came to Samaria, these people that were new believers, Peter, Peter and John prayed for them. They laid their hands on them. And they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why did Peter and John come from Jerusalem to do this? Why did Philip not do this? This was probably a unifying thing that God was doing. You've been racist all these years. You wouldn't have anything to do with each other. And God was probably showing them at in the church of Jesus Christ, we're all one. Just as the Jerusalem church was born under the leadership of John and, uh, and Peter, and they received the Holy Spirit under their leadership, so the Samaritans did. So it was probably God's way of joining the Samaritans as Christians back to the new fledgling church. Well, when all of this happened, and when Simon the sorcerer saw what Philip could do and how it, it, Peter and John could lay their hands on people and they could receive the Holy Spirit, he wanted to buy that gift. As the scripture before said that he had believed. But then he said he wanted to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit so that he could add this to his repertoire of magic 
think, tricks that he could do. And so Philip said to him, Simon, let your money perish with you because you cannot buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. God sovereignly gives that gift. Now, was, was Simon really a believer in Jesus Christ? It said he believed. We don't know. We can't tell for sure, but there are some things that may not be. One, the word that's used for believe doesn't always mean saving faith. For example, in James 2.19, it says that the demons believe in Jesus. Are they saved? Of course not. They're not. So whether he was believing to salvation, we can't tell. We don't have any record in this account, and this is the only account that we have of Simon the sorcerer. There is nothing that says that he received the gift of the Holy Spirit when the other Samaritans did. And then the word that um, Philip used when he said, may your money perish with you. That word perish is a very strong word. It's the same word for perish used in God, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the same word that's used here. He said, may your money perish with you. And then in 8.23 it says that he was full of bitterness and captive to sin. Note, sometimes you can act like you're a believer, you can come to church, you can go to Bible studies, you can be kind to people, but you've never really believed in Jesus Christ and ask him to forgive your sin and change your life and make you his child. Looking at Simon the sorcerer should make each one of us make sure that we know that we know that we know that we are a child of God, our sins have been forgiven, and they, we will never, ever, ever perish. And we are totally confident of that. Simon wasn't. Now, as we go through this incident, we see one thing that I think it joined the church together, the Samaritans and the Jew Jews. I think it teaches us something about sorcery and demonism, and it shows us the superiority of Christianity over demonism and the occult. Now, let me just tell you that you'll notice all through the New Testament, you remember in the ministry of Jesus, he was constantly casting out demons. The disciples were constantly casting not demons. Jesus came into a wicked world, and we know that Satan, when he was cast out of heaven, has gone into the world in the form of his servants who are demons, who follow his command. They are his army, and they are evil, and they will one day be judged and thrown into the lake of fire forever and ever. Until then, they want to get every single person possible to follow them to destruction. And they are constantly on the lookout for people who will obey them and refuse to submit to God. Now, I think in our situations, I think we're probably seeing more of the occult now than maybe we did 50 years ago. As our world becomes more divided and evil, as we see the evil surrounding us in so many ways, then I think that Satan, as we said again on Sunday, takes that opportunity just to get in there and to destroy, because that's who he is. He is the deceiver, he is the destroyer, and he wants to destroy every one of us. And so we must be totally on our guard against him. I have a little book. Those of you who have ever been in a Bible study with me know I love Koi Ten Boom. And she's written a lot of books. This is one of the smaller booklets that she has written. Nearly, all, I think all of her books are out of print. We have scoured 
used bookstores through the years, and I think we found all of her books. They're all at the cottage because I read them every summer because they, I think she, um, her testimony was so absolutely amazing of having lived in the prison camp in World War II and still maintaining a testimony of, for the Lord and then coming out and God using her all around the world to tell about her experiences in the prison camps. And naturally in those prison camps, she encountered a lot of the occult and a lot of demonism. And then as she came out after the war, after the evil of the war, and she was primarily in Germany, although she traveled all over the world speaking after that, she encountered uh, demonism. She encountered demon-possessed people or demon-oppressed people. And so in this little book of Defeated Enemies, she talks about the fact that every one of us, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we have the right to use the name and power and blood of Jesus against all the forces of evil and demonism. We have that right. We can claim the blood of Jesus over every evil force. We can claim the name of Jesus. There is power in his name and in his blood which forgives sins. And yeah. we may come face to face one day with people who are actually demon possessed and if we are we know we have the victory over them only through Jesus not through us. And if we ever come into contact with them, we never ever approach them in our own power because we'll be defeated immediately. But Jesus Christ is the victor. He has already obtained victory on the cross and he gives us victory over the spirit world. And you know in Ephesians 6 that it tells us to put on the whole armor of God. We are to have every piece, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation. And we are to pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. All so that we are ready at any time to meet our foe. Now let me just tell you, there are certain things that you need to be careful about and you need to be careful, for, tell your grandchildren to be careful about because Satan is a deceiver. He wants to come into your life, like we said, through anger lets him in, sin lets him into your life, but there are other ways that he gets in and it's through any association with the occult. That means horoscopes, fortune tellers, tarot cards, palm reading, seances, Ouija boards, anything that you are involved in that lets the power of Satan and calls on people from the dead to give you guidance is not of God and don't go anywhere near it. I personally don't like to watch any television shows that show that kind of evil. I don't, it's, I don't think it's of God. It, it's, it doesn't bear witness with my spirit that it's good. And so I turn off the TV. I heard people of turning off the TV during um, uh, the Super Bowl. I never had it on because Ron wasn't home, and so <laughs> wasn't anything I needed to see. And he said he turned it off during the halftime. Things like this that Satan wants to get into our lives. We stay away from them, ladies. Jesus Christ, again, is the victor. He is the conqueror. He is the one who can deal with Satan's evil, and we stay as far away from it as we can get. So this is a great little book. I only have one copy, and I really don't want to lose it, but you may find it in a bookstore as well. But there are lots of other books. Neil, Arm uh, Neil uh, Anderson has written books on dealing with the darkness. There are other books that you can read. But like... Um, 
C.S. Lewis said, one thing we need to be careful about is that we understand who Satan is, we understand what he's doing, we stay away from him, but we don't pay so much attention to him that we, we omit Jesus. We follow Jesus, but we're aware of Satan's tactics so that we don't get involved. Okay? We're going to see this throughout the book of Acts. This is our first time that we come in contact with them. That's why I wanted to talk about it today because we will see it again. It was very rampant in the days when Jesus came. It will also be very rampant in the days when Jesus comes again. And that's why I think we are seeing an increase in it now because we're getting closer to the time when Jesus is going to come again. And when he does, before he comes, it will be the worst time the world has ever seen because it will be ruled by Satan and his evil army of demons. So stay away from them. Be aware of who they are. But count on the power, love, blood, name of Jesus and follow him and stay away from anything in the occult. So um, Philip then um, preached to them. We don't know about what Simon is, what Simon finally did, but Peter and John went back to Jerusalem and Philip went on his way. And as he went on his way, an angel told him to take the desert road down to Gaza. You know where Gaza is. You hear about it all the time in the news. He went down to Gaza, and as he did, as he was walking through the desert, he met a man who was in a chariot, and he was reading from Isaiah chapter 53. He heard the man reading. Now, this is odd, I find. He was a eunuch. I've always not really understood eunuchs, but I, I looked it up so I could tell you. I, know, I always knew they were castrated, okay, that part, but I didn't really understand why. And the reason that they castrated these men to become eunuchs is then because they would put them in charge of things in the palace like their harem, and they don't have to worry about eunuchs with their harem. So that was one reason. Another reason is, if they were for people who were close to the ruling power, the king, and if they were castrated, there was no way that if they took over with the coup that they could establish a new dynasty. So a lot of the ones who, the men who were closely around the rulers of that day, and in a lot of different countries, they were castrated. So this man was uh, an Ethiopian unit from Ethiopia. He was a proselyte to Judaism, he had a convert to Judaism, and he had come from Ethiopia to go to the temple in Jerusalem. And so as he was going home, he was reading from Isaiah 53, and the Spirit of God brought Philip right up to the chariot, and Philip said, do you know what you're reading? He said, how can I understand unless somebody explain it to him? So Philip explained to him that passage that you hear every single Easter, because it talks about the suffering of Christ. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And so Philip jumped up in the chariot with the eunuch, explained to him that this was speaking of Jesus and the suffering that he had to go through. <clears throat> and then... Obviously, the eunuch believed this, believed in Jesus, and when he did, he said to Philip, why can't I be baptized? Because now I believe in Jesus. So Philip said, well, you can. They got out of the chariot. They found some water in the desert. Philip baptized him, and then as he, Philip was bringing him out of the water, he disappeared. Philip disappeared, and the eunuch went on his way rejoicing because he had come to know Jesus Christ, his sins had been forgiven, and God had used the man Philip to bring this truth to him. So, as we look at this, we see three things. 
The Word of God, if we are trying to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ, the Word of God is number one. They have to understand that Jesus Christ is God and that he died for their sins to forgive them. Then secondly, we need the leading of the Holy Spirit when we're to open our mouth and when we're not. We need the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. And then when the Holy Spirit does lead us, we need a human voice to be able to share the truth. So let's pray that all of us will be that human voice under the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God to share the truth of God so that people will come to know to faith. Then as we close, so this last chapter was about Saul, who had been breathing out threats against the church all of this time. There was terrible persecution, and in fact, he was on his way to Damascus, about 150 miles from Jerusalem, still a city today in Syria. He was on his way there, and he had asked the high priest, probably Caiaphas, if he could ha have permission to get take any Christians who might be in that synagogue in Damascus so that he could persecute them. And as he was on his way, all of us walking to Damascus, all of a sudden a bright light shone down from heaven. And he heard a voice that said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? Recognized he was God, it was God speaking to him. He said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And told him to get up and go into the city. So when he did, he, when he got up, he was blind from the bright light. And then he went into the city. He, couldn't, he didn't eat or drink for three days. He couldn't see for three days. And God sent a vision to a, a Christian man in the city of Damascus named Ananias. And he told him that Saul was going to come to see him. And Ananias said, no, no, isn't that the one who's going around persecuting Christians, killing them every time he sees them? Why do you want me to go to him? And then God told him that this is the, my man chosen, in, the one who is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how great things he must suffer for me. So and Paul, Saul went with Ananias, he stayed with him, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know what happened? He immediately began preaching. But at the very first, when he wanted to go out, no one would have anything to do with him. You wonder why? <laughs> he killed you. He was, he was t terrible to anybody who believed, except there was one man. You remember who that was? Barnabas, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And Barnabas, besides Ananias, who took him to his home, Barnabas was the one who took the one who was rejected by everyone else, put his arms around him, and said, I'll help you. I'll be with you. I'll be strong with you. And his, the strength of Barnabas helped make Paul, who is Saul, Saul, strong. Ladies, there are people that come into our lives all the time. People who come into our churches, they come alone, they have no friends. Sometimes they've lost their spouses, they're away from their family, they're lonely, they're our neighbors, they're around us, they're in our churches. And God calls each one of us to be Barnabases, to take in those lonely ones who surround us. You know, it's very easy for us as Christians to have cool friends. Friends we love, and we love to be with them, and we love to go out with them, and they are the best people to surround ourselves. We have this little wall of cool Christian friends. And then somebody comes into our church who doesn't look like us, who doesn't act like us, who obviously doesn't live in our type home. And we kind of move away just a little bit because they're not one of us. Is that what God is calling us to do? No. When he reached out to Saul, look what happened. God changed the world through Saul. Because of one man, Barnabas, 
reached out to him to help him grow as a believer. So, as we end this chapter 9, we're going to find that the church in verse 31, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. It was strengthened and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It grew in number, living in the fear of the Lord. Persecution was down. Why? Because Saul was now a believer. And so the church grew, flourished, spread out living for the Lord. Now, ladies, as we read this, and I, I don't know how many of you read your little pink booklet this week, but this story of the salvation, the conversion of Saul, has to be an encouragement to every single one of us who has ever prayed for an impossible situation. Who would have ever thought that the one who persecuted the church would become a preacher of the church and the greatest missionary that Christianity has probably ever seen. Who would have thought that the terrorist who terrorized Christians everywhere would be converted and his life totally turned around by the Holy Spirit and the power and grace of God? You've probably got an impossible situation in your life You've probably got an impossible friend that you think will never come to know the Lord. I hope this chapter will help all of us to have the faith to believe that God can change anyone. I, this last um, December, I went to Alabama to a family reunion. My mother was, it, and my aunt were get together, and they were the last two of that generation in the family, so the family decided anybody who can come while they're together can come and have a little family reunion. And so I saw cousins I had not seen since childhood. The good news is I found that some had become Christians and believers in Jesus Christ. The, the other news is I still need to keep praying for some. But... Ron and I, in our family and in, have, in our cousins, have seen through the years God do some amazing things that we never thought possible. I'll just tell you about one. I have a cousin who's a professor. Um, he is a, a world-renowned child psychologist. He goes all over the world delivering papers about how to raise children, and the reason he can do this is because he has none. <laughs> he, he has taught in prestigious universities. He's still teaching. His wife is also teaching with him. And I hope he does not listen to this tape because he will recognize himself immediately. But he was on his third marriage, and uh, one day... He was driving along, his life was in shambles, and so he heard Michael J. Smith's song, You Are the Air That I Breathe. And he said he pulled over to the side of the road, and he asked Jesus Christ to come into his heart, forgive his sin, and change his life. He now leads a worship team at his church in Phoenix. His life has been totally, 100% transformed. So has his wife. They've become amazing believers, amazing witnesses for the Lord Jesus. And we never would have thought it could happen. But nothing is impossible with God. That's why we never get up off our knees. We keep praying because I can imagine that every single one of us here has family members, at least in our extended family, who do not know the Savior. And God is in the business of doing the impossible because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So ladies, let's keep it up. Keep on praying day in, day out. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for what it teaches. And Lord, as we close with this, we all have impossible people in our lives that we think will never come to know you. They've hardened their hearts so hard against you. 
Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God would soften their hearts and through a miracle of grace like we see in the apostles, uh, see in Saul who became the apostle Paul, I pray that the Spirit of God would bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. Oh God, we can't do it, but you major in the impossible. So we commit them to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.